majority of you follow me for content like this. The coat or outerwear that a character is wearing, especially if it's really different to the rest of their outfit, is indicative of the persona that they're trying to project. And also he's caught in this dichotomy between feeling like the best and most powerful man in the world and someone who is absolutely hopeless. The thing that I think makes them so tragic is the fact that their ability is only ever triggered when they're in pain. We, as an audience, have absolutely no idea who he actually is. She succumbs to the darkness by deciding to stay in the Port Mafia, but she views her work as a good thing. They can represent reincarnation and life and hope and death, but they can also represent freedom. So by aligning loyalty with cape wearing, we get this really interesting representation going on. And this is great because I love making it and you guys clearly love watching it, but as time goes on, I'm getting more and more comments and DMs from people asking me exactly how I do this. Now, one of my biggest long-term goals for this channel is to tackle more difficult topics such as critical literary analysis and break it down so that more people can understand it. Because these things won't only help you to develop critical thinking skills and analytical skills, but they will also develop your ability to clearly and concisely create and defend an argument. But despite all of these great benefits, many people will never even try to give it a go because, let's be real, lots of artists and art educators are a bit too pretentious to stoop down to the beginner level and help people get started. Lucky for all of us though, not only is this stuff relatively easy to me, but it's really fun and I am so excited to share this video with you all. Today we're going to start from the absolute beginning and talk about what literary analysis is, how it works, and then work through an example text and analyse it together. And when I say that I'm starting from the start, I really mean it. You don't need to know anything about analysis to understand what's going on here. And for those of you looking for something a little more challenging, I have other videos planned that I will hopefully be able to release soon. These take me such a long time to make because I do all of the scripting, filming and editing myself, all while balancing a part-time job and university as well, so I really appreciate everyone's patience and excitement every time I do release a new video. If you want to support me so I can keep making these, then go ahead and like this video and subscribe to my channel. As of filming this, I'm like 200 public watch hours away from being able to monetize my content, which would be game-changing for me. All of my socials are also in the description and the very first link will bring you to my Ko-fi where you can send me a tip if you're feeling extra generous. So without further ado, let's begin our first class in Analysis 101. <laughs> Let's start out with some good old-fashioned definitions so we know exactly what we're working with here. Literary analysis is the examination and evaluation of a literary work, which is a very short definition for something that is so broad and can be really time-consuming. The key words here are literary and evaluation. Literary meaning a written work, so anything from poetry to plays to short stories to novels, and evaluation, which means that this needs to be more than just a summary of the story. It should also include an argument that you want to make Make about the text that you've just read. And to make an argument doesn't mean that you should just scream your thoughts about the text. While this can be very fun, an argument is just the point that you want to make about everything. If we take Little Red Riding Hood, for example, you could argue that the story is a coming of age, but you could also argue that it is a horror or a fantasy or any genre that you want to argue that it is, as long as you have evidence to back yourself up. Because you can't just say anything about the text that you've just read. You have to be able to convince the person that you're talking to that you are right, and the way to do this is to gather evidence as you read. And there are different types of arguments that you can make in a literary analysis, and understanding what argument you want to make will help you choose what evidence you want to look for. Here are five of the most common types of arguments. First we have the close reading or formalist argument. For a formalist argument, you'll want to pay close attention to the technical parts of the text. So for example, the word choices that an author makes to describe something. Think for example of all the different ways that a character might say, I want you to close the window because it's cold in here. They could say something like, oh my god, it's so cold in here. Are you cold as well? Hang on, I think the window's open. Are you do you want to close it? Do you think we could close it? Is that okay? I know you stress that you're closer. Is that okay? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Or they could say something more along the lines of, it's cold. 
close the window. At the end of the day, these sentences get the same message across, but the implications of how they are said change everything. The first implies that the character is of a lower social status than the person that they are talking to. It could also indicate that maybe they're very shy or polite by nature. The second sentence indicates the opposite. This is a character who really doesn't care how they're perceived by the listener. Maybe they're very close with the listener so they don't need to bother with formalities, maybe they're mean or they just don't understand why you would say so many words when you could just say five. These are the differences that a formalist approach focuses on and I personally find it really interesting to look at how the same character talks to different people or how their manner of speech changes over time. In the context of manga and other visual works such as plays, a formalist approach could also draw your attention to interesting choices within the art. I've talked about this already with things like the coat theory in Bungo Stray Dogs and how carefully constructed all of the characters' designs are. Our second type of argument is the applied reading argument, and this is highly subjective because it compares the text to your own personal experiences. If you watch my video about No Longer Human, you'll notice that I spend a lot of time talking about how relatable the main character Yozo is. This is a great start to an applied reading argument, but it hardly counts as one, because while I talk a lot about why Yozo is relatable, I don't talk about how anything that he does relates specifically to my own life. If I wanted to make a proper argument, I would first pinpoint a couple of moments within the text that I relate to really deeply, and then I would discuss why I relate to them and use detailed examples from my own life. Third, we have the comparative or synergistic argument, which takes the text that you're looking at already and then compares it with other texts. And it's best to use this kind of approach when you have a couple of really strong connecting threads between each text. For example, you might notice that different texts share a lot of the same themes, or maybe they're written in the same style but depict very different things, and you want to draw attention to that. Or maybe you're very interested in one author and notice that there is an underlying message in all of their works and want to prove it. A comparative approach should either Either prove that multiple texts are very similar or that they're very different, but if you're careful you can prove that they are both at the same time. Next is the contextual or historical argument, and this focuses on the historical framework of the text. So what was going on in the world at the time that made the text turn out the way that it did? A lot of classic literature in particular is considered classic because while they're very much products of their time, modern audiences can still relate very deeply to them. It makes a lot of sense to use a historical argument if you're talking about a text that uses a lot of language, settings, and themes that don't appear very often in modern texts. It won't only help your audience Audience to understand why you make some of the arguments that you do, but the added context may give you a completely different understanding to what you had initially. Finally, we have the theoretical argument. This is the kind of argument that I use and talk about most often. It looks for evidence in the text to support specific theories. And the best way to look for evidence of these theories is by viewing the text through a specific lens. Yes, I'm sorry, there is one more aspect that I'll have to explain before we can piece everything together. The definition of a critical lens is a way of focusing on style choices, plot devices, and character interactions, and how they show a certain theme. Which is just a fancy way to say that when you look at the text through a lens, you'll be able to pick up on the very specific pieces of evidence that align with the theme you're interested in. Four very common lenses are psychoanalytic, which focuses on understanding the character's emotional and mental states, feminist, which examines the story through the lens of women's experiences, Marxist, which pays close attention to the socioeconomic issues within the text by thinking of it as a product of the society from which it came from, and queer, which considers queer identities and the queering of characters, actions, and speech. As an example, you might be reading a text that is anti-war and want to focus on how it depicts the mentality of the soldiers, in which case you would read through a psychoanalytic lens paying very close attention to the soldiers' actions and speech to try and figure out how they're feeling. But remember that the kind of lens that you use will change depending on the specific evidence that you're looking for. You could also analyze an anti-war text through a Marxist lens if you wanted to focus on how the fictional society mirrors real life, or a fatalist lens if you wanted to focus on ideas of freedom versus fate. Just remember that there are heaps of other lenses that I haven't mentioned that you can use for your analysis, but we're not going to get into them today because it's just going to be way too overwhelming. So now that we know what analysis is and we understand five different types of arguments and four lenses, how do we put it all together? Before you write anything, you want to make sure that you know what you're talking about. And the best way to do this is by gathering evidence, which is a process that I split into two parts. First, you'll want to familiarize yourself with the text, so read the entire thing at least once without annotating it. 
This is a great time to ask questions and note down theories as you go along, but remember it will always be easier to gather information on a text that you're already really familiar with. Once you've finished your first read through, you can finally reread with all of your themes and lenses in mind as you go along and annotate while you do as well. While you're doing this, it's useful to create an outline of the plot and a list of important characters. I usually have my notes app or a notebook or even just sticky notes with me so that I can keep all of my ideas in one place. Once you've finished annotating and you you have all of your evidence, it's finally time to create your argument and there are some important things that you need to keep in mind when you do this. If you haven't been taking notes already, I do suggest that you keep track of these because it's really important to include all of them and they'll actually make writing your analysis a little bit easier. At the beginning, you'll want to at least mention the text type and genre that you're analysing. So for example, is it a play or a novel or a poem? Is it a sci-fi or a fantasy or a thriller? All of these have very specific conventions, so make sure you you talk about how the text plays into those or how it doesn't, how it sort of bends the rules. You'll need to examine the important characters and provide an outline of the important parts of the text, so this can be the plot or the themes or both. Make sure you include a review of the themes that you'll be discussing in the analysis and the symbols that are used to represent these themes and try to at least mention the text's overall structure as well. Now this is a lot and I'm really sorry that it's difficult for me to break this down any further, but let me make it up to you. Let's work together through that sample text that I mentioned earlier in the video. This is a story that I have loved ever since I was really little and my Australian audience may be familiar with it but other people may not. And that story is Edward the Emu. And yes, it is a kid's book, but anyone who thinks that children's literature is any less profound or moving has clearly never analysed kids' lit. So let's begin by going back to step one and familiarising ourselves with the text. We're going to read the whole story together, and if you would like when we're finished, you can pause the video and write your own analytical comment. Edward the Emu was sick of the zoo. There was nowhere to go. There was nothing to do. And compared to the seals that lived right next door, well, being an emu was frankly a bore. So that night, when the zookeeper went home to bed, Edward jumped from his pen and he laughed as he said, the seals are best, anybody can tell, so tomorrow I'll just be a seal as well. The next morning at nine when they opened the zoo, the seals were swimming and Edward was too. He dived in the water and basked in the sun and he balanced a ball on his beak just for fun. Well, Edward was really enjoying the day till he overheard someone behind the fence say, the seals are always amusing, it's true, but the the lion's the best thing to see at the zoo. So that night when the zookeeper went home to bed, Edward jumped from the pool and he smiled as he said, the lion's the best, anybody can tell, so tomorrow I'll just be a lion as well. The next morning at nine when they opened the zoo, the lions were roaring and Edward was too. He snarled at the ladies and growled at the men. Life was certainly grand for a lion in his den. Well, Edward was having a wonderful day, till a man in the crowd had the gumption to say, the lion's a beast I shall always detest. The snakes are the things that I like to see best. So that night, when the zookeeper went home to bed, Edward crept from the cage and he grinned as he said, If the snakes are the best things and that's what they say, then tomorrow I'll just be a snake for the day. The next morning at nine, when they opened the zoo, the snakes were all hissing, and Edward was too. He slipped round the rocks. It was magic to see. Then he curled himself casually up round a tree. While Edward was just warming up for the day, when he overheard one of the visitors say, the snakes are impressive, I know that it's true, but the emu's by far the best thing at the zoo. The emu, gasped Edward, my goodness, that's me! I'm the thing that that gentleman most likes to see. Not the seals, the lions, the snakes and the rest, it's Edward the emu he likes to see best. So that night when the zookeeper went home to bed, Edward slipped from the cage and he laughed as he said, if the emu's the best, then that's easy then. Tomorrow, I'm Edward the emu again. Edward ran to the place where he used to reside, but oh, what a shock when he clambered inside. He found himself suddenly come face to face with the emu they'd brought in to take Edward's place. The emus considered each other a while. Then the new emu said with a shy little smile, Hello, I'm Edwina. It's nice meeting you. You're the best thing I've seen since I came to the zoo. You're probably starting to realise why I chose to analyse this text with you. Not only is it short and sweet, but it also has a very clear underlying theme. And that theme is the idea of identity, acceptance and belonging. So with that in mind, let's look back on the text and find some key moments that will fit into our theme. And if you're wondering, we're going to be using a psychoanalytic lens while also focusing a little bit on a formalist argument as well. This story, which is told via a series of images and short rhyming paragraphs, spans approximately 
four days, and each new day gives us more information about Edward's mentality. But even from the very first page, we know that Edward is unhappy with his life. He hates being a boring emu in a boring emu enclosure, and he hates that he isn't having nearly as much fun as it sounds like the seals next door are having. So he decides that since seals obviously have the most fun, he wants to be a seal for the day, and that is exactly what he is. Towards the end of this day, though, we get two new pieces of information which indicate that this isn't exactly what it seems at first glance. The first is that he doesn't specifically want to be a seal, he just doesn't want to be an emu. And the second is the reason why he doesn't want to be an emu. At first we could assume that it was just boredom, but it turns out that people's perception of him is very, very important to Edward. Our evidence for this is that when he hears someone say, the lion's the best thing to see at the zoo, he immediately plans to jump out of the seal enclosure and go be a lion the next day. And we get more evidence when on the third day the exact same thing happens. When someone says the snakes are the things that I like to see best, we get the cycle repeated again, this time Edward goes to live with the snakes for a day. What's interesting though is that even though Edward is having a really wonderful time being a snake, when he overhears someone say that emu's by far the best thing at the zoo, he is absolutely ecstatic. He uses exclamative language for the very first time in the whole story, and this is also the first time that we get an illustration of Edward smiling with his mouth open rather than just a little but he says the emu, my goodness that's me, and he travels back to the emu enclosure. Not only does this further prove the point that I just made, but it also proves that Edward is happiest when people like him for being himself, not when they like him for pretending to be a different animal. And when he does get back to the emu enclosure and meets Edwina for the first time, she further validates his identity by saying that he is the best thing she's seen since she came to the zoo. Now I want you to focus on how the ideas of identity, acceptance, and belonging were portrayed within this story. Because acceptance is a really big word, right? Like, what are we accepting? Why are we accepting it? And what does it have to do with identity and belonging? Well, what we're accepting is Edward's identity in its entirety. Not Seal Edward, not Lion Edward, not Snake Edward, Edward. The self-conscious, silly little emu who just wants to be loved. We accept that no matter how hard he tries, and my god does he try, he can't change the fact that he's an emu. Seal Edward is too tall and Lion Edward is particularly scrawny and Snake Edward doesn't have all that many scales because at the core of his identity is the fact that he's an emu regardless how much he tries to contort his body into new shapes. The message here is that there will always be people out there who think that you're the best just as you are and while you can never be everyone's favourite, you're somebody's favourite and they will always have a place for you to belong. This is also why I think it's really important that at the end Edward didn't just miraculously stop caring what others thought about him, this is still an integral part of his identity. Being the best thing at the zoo is just as important to Edward at the end of the story as it was at the beginning, what's changed is that he's found people who will always love him just as he is. And so now he doesn't have to pretend to be anything else and he can be fully comfortable in his own identity. And while this story is great for any kid to hear, I want to draw your attention to how important it is for queer kids to hear especially. If you go back and read this through a queer lens, it will add an entirely new layer to your analysis. Because identity, acceptance and belonging are notoriously difficult subjects for queer people to talk about, and I'm not going to get too much deeper into that because I want you to have a go on your own. If you have any ideas that you want to share though, please leave a comment because I would love to hear them. And this brings us to the end of our first lesson in Analysis 101. Was this easy enough for you to follow? Was it too easy? Are there things that you want me to explain in more depth? Please let me know because I will add them to my next video. In future videos I want to dig deeper into the concepts that I've introduced you guys to today and I want to tackle more difficult texts as well. But even with just this beginner knowledge there is so much critical analysis that you can do. And the more you practice the more challenging texts you'll be able to pick up. Honestly the video that I'm most excited to share with you guys is one that I'm planning about poetry analysis because poetry analysis, poetry reading in general, is a totally different experience to analysing anything else. Until the next video, I post on TikTok and Twitter literally every day, so you should go follow me there if you want more regular updates. And give this video a like if you wanna, that would mean a lot to me. Subscribe if you wanna, that would also mean a lot to me. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye!